Hey, I'm Rob Witcher from Destination Certification, and I'm here to help you pass the CCSB exam. We're going to go through a review of the major topics related to privacy, outsourcing, and cloud contracts in Domain 6 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies. This is the first of two videos for Domain 6. I'm including links to the other mind map videos in the description below. These mind maps are a tiny part of our complete CCSB masterclass. Let's begin with a definition of privacy. It's the state or condition of being free from being observed or disturbed by other people. That's a really good definition of privacy that you should remember for the exam. But what does it mean being free from being observed and disturbed? Essentially, privacy is the idea that an individual can withhold parts of their personal information from wider society to control what personal information others know about them, as an individual's personal information can potentially be used against them in ways that would disturb them, limit what jobs they can get, where they can travel, uh, whether they can get health insurance, etc. The major thing that we are protecting from a privacy perspective is personal data, which can be defined as information that can be used on its own or in combination to identify an individual. There are two types of personal data or personally identifiable information that you should know about. Regulated PII is personal information that must be safeguarded according to a specific regulatory regime, such as GDPR. So obviously regulated PI, it's regulated by a specific regulation. Contractual PII is personal information that must be protected according to contractual work agreements or requirements. As an example, an organization may be processing personal data on behalf of another organization. You'd have to abide by any safeguards that were set out in the contract so that's contractual PII, the protection of the data is based on contracts. Now here's a couple of important and subtle definitions to remember. Applicable law refers to the specific set of laws or legal standards that govern a particular case or contract. This determines which rules, statutes, or regulations are used to interpret legal obligations and rights. So for instance, a contract might specify that California law applies meaning California's legal codes will be used to resolve any disputes related to that contract. So that's the applicable law. Jurisdiction refers to the authority of a particular court or legal body to hear and decide a case. It's about where or who has the power to enforce and interpret the applicable law. So for example, a court in British Columbia may have jurisdiction over a case involving parties within its geographic area, even if the applicable law is from another state or country. Many jurisdictions throughout the world have their own data privacy acts. Organizations must abide by the applicable legislation, which can get very complicated very quickly to figure out what's applicable. You have to look very carefully about where an organization operates in which jurisdictions to figure out which are the applicable laws. So talk to a lawyer. There are loads of different privacy laws and regulations around the world, and I'm happy to report that you do not need to be an expert on all of them for the CCSP exam. You should, however, know a wee bit about GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which is the core of the European Union's digital privacy legislation. GDPR is an extremely important regulation as it is one of the most stringent in the world and many countries around the world model their privacy regulations on GDPR. So when a, when a country is updating their privacy laws, they'll often model it after GDPR. So GDPR is essentially like a global bellwether for privacy. It's leading practice in privacy regulations. GAP, the General Accepted Privacy Principles, uh, was actually renamed the Privacy Framework or the Privacy Management Framework, the PMF in 2020, but everyone usually still refers to it as GAP. The PMF, the Privacy Management Framework, aims to help organizations create privacy programs that can bring about opportunities while mitigating risks and addressing obligations. So GAP is best practices from a privacy perspective. In some cases, Sets of international legislation may come into conflict with each other, which can present organizations with complex legal challenges. One example is the US Cloud Act and EU's GDPR. As long as certain conditions are met, a warrant under the US Cloud Act allows American authorities to compel the recipient to disclose data, no matter where it's stored. If that data is stored by an EU European Union-based subsidiary and includes information about EU residents, 
Disclosing the data could be a breach under GDPR. In these kinds of complicated legal scenarios, you really need to find experienced legal counsel to help you resolve these conflicts. So again, talk to a lawyer. Stuff can get very complicated. Uh, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, have come up with a set of privacy guidelines or principles. I'm emphasizing the word here, guidelines, because guidelines are not mandatory. They are best practices, suggestions. This is very much true of the OECD privacy principles. They are not mandatory requirements that an organization must meet, but rather they provide best practices and the basis for the creation of a leading privacy program within an organization. The OECD guidelines help organizations structure their privacy program and consider what the program should cover. Eight privacy principles are defined in the OECD guidelines and let's go through them. The first is collection limitation, which means that organizations should limit the collection of PII, obtain it lawfully and where appropriate, with the knowledge or consent of the data subject, the data subject being the individual to whom the data is about. The data quality principle means PII should be relevant, accurate, complete, and kept up to date. In other words, if an organization collects PII, they are now accountable for the integrity and accuracy of that personal data. The purpose specification principle means the purposes for which PII is collected should be specified when collected. Organizations should clearly articulate what the collected PII will be used for. The use limitation principle means PII should only be used, disclosed, based on the purpose for which it was collected with consent of the data subject or authority or law. So purpose specification, say why you're collecting it. Use limitation, only use it for those purposes. Security safeguards means PII should be protected by reasonable security controls against lost, unauthorized access, destruction, use, modification, etc. Basically, that good security controls need to be in place to protect the PII. The openness principle relates to an organization's culture. There should be a general policy of openness about developments, practices, and policies with respect to PII. It, organizations should not hide or be sketchy about what they're collecting and using PII for. The individual participation principle means an individual, a data subject, should have the right to obtain their data from the controller and have their data even removed. Under GDPR, this is often referred to as the right to be forgotten. So individual participation is that individuals should have control over who collects their data and what they use it for and whether they remove it. And the last principle, accountability, means a data controller should be accountable for complying with these principles. In other words, they must be an owner, a data controller, who has clear accountability for the protection of PII. That's what the accountability principle is all about. Organizations that collect PII have to be accountable for the protection of that data. And so that's why they should usually assign a role like a data controller that will be accountable for the data. Next topic here, cross-border data transfers. Some jurisdictions, such as the European Union, have restrictions on how personal data can be transferred outside of their physical borders. You need to be aware of this legislation before you make any transfers. Otherwise, you may have regulatory violations on your hand. This is an especially easy trap to fall into in the cloud because it's so easy to accidentally store or transfer data to other countries around the world. There are a range of roles that you need to understand in the cloud. It's important to note who is accountable and who is responsible for what. The data subject is the individual to whom any personal data relates. It's data about them. The data owner, also known as the data controller, is the most important role as the owner is accountable for the protection of the data. The owner will define the classification for the data and the owner is then accountable for ensuring the data is protected accordingly. And just remember, data controller, data owner, same thing. Data custodians have a technical responsibility for data, meaning custodians are responsible for ensuring data security, availability, capacity, that backups are performed, or that data can be restored. They are responsible for the technical aspects of data. And data custodians have a particularly challenging job in the cloud because often when you move data to the cloud, you lose a lot of technical control over that data, making the job of a data custodian very difficult because they're supposed to have a technical responsibility for the data. Data stewards, on the other hand, have a business responsibility for the data, meaning data stewards are responsible for ensuring data governance, data quality, compliance. Essentially, data stewards are typically employees from the business who are responsible for ensuring the data is useful for business purposes. 
Data processors, as the name implies, are responsible for processing data on behalf of the owner. A typical example of a data processor is a cloud service provider. They are storing and processing data on behalf of the owner. Okay, moving on to the next major section of this mind map, outsourcing and contracts. Your organization is likely reliant on a bunch of different cloud service providers. This outsourcing helps your company focus on what it does best, but it also means that you're gonna to have to rely on a bunch of other parties in order to keep the gears turning. We use contracts to ensure that vendors live up to their promises. Before anyone signs a contract, it's important to assess the risks from each individual provider. Whenever you're outsourcing something, you are ceding a degree of control, giving up a degree of control. You need to do a thorough risk assessment to ensure that the provider can meet the, mean, the needs of your organization and that the provider will be a trustworthy partner throughout the business relationship. Uh, we've discussed accountability and responsibility a bunch of times now in these mind maps, primarily in the first mind map of domain one, link in the description below. What bears repeating is that ultimately the customer remains accountable for the security of their data. The customer cannot outsource the accountability for the protection of their data, but they can delegate the responsibility. Contracts are essential for cloud services because they define and protect the rights, responsibility, and expectations of both the service provider and the customer. Cloud service contracts serve as a legal foundation for the relationship and address critical aspects such as data security, service levels, liability, and compliance, among other things. An MSA, a Master Services Agreement, if we want to build a long-term legal relationship with a provider, we will often set up an MSA, which defines the basics of the relationship, such as definitions, dispute resolution, and contract termination clauses. So an MSA acts as a foundation with uh, another organization from a legal contracting perspective. If we establish an MSA, then we can create individual statements of work, SOWs, as contracts on a per project basis. By having an MSA outlining the relationship, it can help to reduce some of the legal costs associated with each individual project while still allowing flexibility for each project. One important contract tool that we've talked about, but it's worth repeating, is that they can be used as SLAs. SLAs can be used to communicate requirements to a cloud service provider. SLAs are documented commitments by the service provider to a consumer covering things like confidentiality, integrity, availability, responsiveness, and so forth. And SLAs, remember, are an addendum to the overall contract. An NDA is a non-disclosure agreement. When signing up with or using certain services, you may be forbidden from disclosing certain information about the service and the relationship. So that's what NDAs can be used for to help to ensure that people don't, different parties don't disclose, disclose certain information. As a cloud customer, you generally aren't able to audit your provider yourself. Most of the big cloud providers will not provide a right to audit. Instead, you'll have to rely on third-party audits to hopefully provide you with the assurance that you're looking for. Contract management is important for ensuring that both the provider and the customer fulfill their duties. Contract management can involve a range of stakeholders throughout the customer organization, including legal, IT, security, finance, compliance, operations, leadership, etc. Contract management involves reviewing initial contracts to ensure that it includes key requirements and then monitoring the contract throughout the relationship to ensure that the provisions, the contract is met. If there are disputes, you may need to pursue arbitration and termination of the contract. So contract management, simply put, is obviously managing contracts. Vendor management is the process that involves defining business goals and requirements, choosing the best provider, monitoring performance, and consistently making sure goals are consistently met. Security must be involved right from the start and throughout the entire process of this vendor management. And then the final part of this mind map here, cloud services are really just another part of your organization's overall supply chain. So like any other supply chain, you must manage it carefully. Two important standards for supply chain management include ISO 28000, which is a specification for security management systems for the supply chain, and ISO 27036, which is a standard that delves into information security for supplier relationships. Uh, part four in particular is especially important because it discusses guidelines for security of cloud services. So those two ISO frameworks, 28,000 and 27,036, 
both speak to how to properly manage your supply chain of service providers. And there you go. That's an overview of privacy, outsourcing, and cloud contracts within Domain 6, covering the most critical concepts you need to know for the exam. Thank you.